Today on the It's a Super Nice Rainy Day Says podcast, I will be discussing why you should not delete your YouTube videos, why people use microphones in frame, and other stuff too, so go ahead and stick around. Let's start with a discussion about why you shouldn't delete your YouTube videos. And this piece of information, and dare I call it a revelation, stems from X or Twitter. I don't know if that has ever been said. A useful piece of information came from Twitter? What? It has finally happened. Twitter can retire now. They have fulfilled their goal. A single piece of information has come from it. But this comes from a post from somebody named Todd B. Their username is at Hitsman. If you don't know who Todd B is, he is a product lead for a YouTube homepage and recommendation, and he has been in that position since 2014, so this guy knows what he's talking about. This is as close as we can get to straight from the horse's mouth when it comes to YouTube. But his post says, YouTubers, don't delete videos unless you have a very, very good reason. When you delete a video, you delete your channel's connection to the audience that watched that video. Video. If you want to maximize your growth, keep your videos public or unlist them if you must. That is the entire post, but I found that so incredibly fascinating and revealing because this tells us that YouTube ties viewers to your channel directly through your videos. I had always assumed that YouTube would create categories for your videos. This video is about microphones. This video is about audio. This video is about a Razer Siren V3 Mini. Person X watched that video, therefore, they are interested in microphones, audio, and the Razer Siren. I thought that connection from the viewer to those topics and to my channel would have been stored separately from the actual video. But it sounds as though those connections may exist, but the connections are based on that video existing on your channel. And once that video goes away, that connection and that piece of information that person X likes microphones, audio, and the Razer Siren is erased. That's crazy to me. I never thought that is how it was handled. So if you're a YouTuber, it turns out you should not delete your videos because that is going to remove that viewer, that connection to that viewer from your channel. If you have to get rid of a video, just unlist it to maintain that connection. I have seen channels when I used to frequent Social Blade and they would have months where they have minus 20 million views because they deleted so many videos. If they had just unlisted them, those views would still be there. And that connection to those viewers who watch those videos, those 20 million views, would still exist. This is huge to me. Maybe everybody knew this and I'm just late to the party. But this is good information. If you are a YouTuber and you are not following Hitsman on Twitter, on X, go follow him. Follow him and follow Renee Ritchie, YouTube liaison. I think they are two of the most valuable resources for YouTubers and content creators because they just drop little nuggets of truth like this every now and again. And it's incredible. This is information we should all have. They should plaster this on the front page of YouTube Studio. Don't delete your videos, you dope. Keep them. Unlist them if you must, but do not delete them. But you got to get this information from Twitter? Why? Come on. (laughs) That's silly. This should be on the front page of YouTube. But it's not. So go follow him. That is it for that story. I just had to share that because I think this is really important. And I have seen so many YouTubers delete their videos. Luckily, the only times I have deleted videos is because I made a huge error, there was missing footage, and I had to re-upload something. And I couldn't leave it unlisted because notifications would still be out there and people would get that incorrect information, so I felt the need to actually delete those videos. So unfortunately, I have had to do this, and the re-uploads always seem to do worse because those viewers who watch the first upload do not come back. Okay, that is it for that news story now. Go follow them and take this and bury it into your content creator YouTuber mind. 
do not delete your videos. I will never do it again unless I have to. Now let's jump to the topic of why people use microphones in frame. And this stems from a comment that I got on last week's episode from Peter. And he said, I think because you're coming from large diaphragm mics six inches away from you, you think laughs are worse than they are. Don't get me wrong, they have an unnatural sound because we don't put our ear up against someone's chest to listen to them. But a so- But as a solo freelance videographer, if a job calls for a lav, you use it because it's the right tool for the job. Lavs are used in movies, TV shows, broadcast news, and they sound good enough. By the way, before YouTube, no one would use large diaphragm mics like you do unless they were in a recording studio or on radio. It looks ridiculous and it's distracting, but that's fine because everyone now is doing it, but you would never see that anywhere else besides YouTube. I'm not mad, just pointing out what you think is good is a very subjective thing. Peter, thank you very much for the comment, and thank you for pushing back and sharing your side of this discussion. I am no expert when it comes to location sound. I am not a solo videographer that does corporate gigs or anything. I am a dope who makes YouTube videos and records music in their free time. That is what I do. That is my perspective of things. So I really appreciate when you share this information, when I get pushback from anybody on areas that they are experts in because it helps me learn. It helps me improve the understanding of these topics and get better at what I do. So thank you very much. I also agree completely that the sound from lav microphones and large diaphragm condensers or small diaphragm condensers or shotgun microphones is vastly different, and switching back and forth between them is going to make the lav mic sound significantly worse than it would if you were just listening to the lav mic in a vacuum without the context or the information of what an LDC or SDC sounds like in that situation. I also want to clarify that last week I was not saying that nobody should ever use a lav mic because lav microphones, just like every single microphone, are tools. Tools exist to fulfill a purpose. There are going to be situations where you cannot have a static microphone out of frame, you don't have a boom op, and having a microphone in frame is unacceptable. In situations like that, you don't have any other option other than a lav mic. If that is the only option, use the lav mic. If you have done tests and determined that the lav mic is the best sounding of the bunch, use the lav mic. Microphone selection is nothing more than saying, this is the best tool for this job, so I am going to use that. You're not going to use a wrench to hammer a nail, you're going to use a hammer to hammer a nail. You're not going to use a standard large diaphragm condenser to record underwater sounds, you're going to use some kind of hydrophonic microphone. It's about choosing the right tool for the job. So I wasn't saying do not ever use lav mics. I just wanted to point that out. I also think that understanding the typical playback system and playback location by the end consumer of your audio is really important because that is going to determine what level of masking will occur, for lack of a better word. What I mean is if you have audio piping directly into your ears through headphones where you are blocking out all of the ambient noise, all the imperfections in the audio that you're listening to is going to be much more obvious. Well, conversely, if you have audio playing through the speakers on your TV, the TV is six feet away, you have an air conditioning unit going on in the background, you are going to get away with a lot more because there is so much masking going on to hide the imperfections in the audio. So understanding how people consume your content is incredibly important in determining what level of imperfection is acceptable. For years, I have watched movies, TV shows, podcasts, and YouTube videos on my TV, and on the content where they use lav mics, I have never given a second thought to the audio. I have thought, hey, that's perfectly fine. I can hear what is being said. Job done. There is a podcast that I really enjoyed, and they started by using handheld dynamics. Still sounded kind of bad, but it was tolerable. 
Then they switched to laugh mics, and when I watched the show on my TV, I thought, "Hey, that sounds pretty good. I can hear them. They feel more free. They can move about. They're not concerned about a microphone in their face. They're not concerned with mic technique." But once I put on my headphones, I thought, "Yikes! This is not as good as I thought it was." The processing was terrible. The bleed was terrible. The ambient noise was terrible. It was a very bad listening experience, and I could not listen to the show via headphones because the audio was so bad, because the environment was so bad, because the mic selection was so bad. Of course, that is anecdotal. That is based on a single show where they had poor mic selection, poor processing, poor room treatment. Everything. It was a perfect storm. But that is to drive home the point that playback system, understanding the end consumer of your audio, is really important. Because on my TV. That's fine. I could not care less because there is so much masking of imperfections occurring. But once I put on my headphones, I am going to be much more critical. And how do the majority of podcasts get consumed? They get consumed through headphones being shoved in your ears, so every single imperfection in the audio is going to be noticeable. How does the majority of television, news broadcasts, and movies get consumed? Played back over a television, where there are speakers blasting through your room, where there's a bunch of ambient noise that is masking all of those imperfections, that is masking the shift between a shotgun microphone and a lav microphone, that is masking the bleed between microphones. So understanding that is important, and that's my point. Now let's jump to the main topic, and that would be why do people use microphones in frame? I believe this comes down to three main factors. Number one is mimicry. Number two is conditioning or getting the sound that you want. And number three is going to be overcoming shortcomings. First up is mimicry, and that is the most obvious answer to this question. I see a bunch of people using that microphone, therefore I will buy the microphone and use it in the same way that they use it. In my opinion, that is why we saw the Blue Yeti get so popular about a decade ago, and why we see the SM7B getting so popular nowadays. Because people started using it, then when new content creators came around, they saw a bunch of people using the Blue Yeti and said, "Well, I guess I'm going to buy that too." When people started nowadays, they see, oh, a bunch of people are using the SM7B. I guess I'll buy that too. The reason I think this occurs is when content creators are just starting out, they are far from well versed in terms of production, so they have no idea what the right gear for them is. On top of that, they don't even know what questions to ask to determine what the right gear for them is. So the simplest solution for them is. I see everybody else using that microphone. They can't all be wrong, so I'll buy that as well. I see everybody else using that light. They can't all be wrong, so I'll buy that light. I watch their content. They use that gear. The content they make is easily consumable. I will mimic what they are doing. And really, that makes perfect sense. All of us gearheads may not understand it, but I think we should try to understand it. If they don't care about gear, if they don't care about production, and if they don't care about learning about production, the simplest solution is: I know people with this gear get good quality. I'll just get that. That is factor number one: mimicry. Factor number two is getting the sound that you want or conditioning. And what I mean by this is, when podcasts were just starting out, what was the spoken word format before that? Talk radio. So when podcasters were starting, what were they trying to accomplish? They were trying to get the same quality production that talk radio had. What did that mean? You are going to have a large diaphragm condenser, a broadcast dynamic, a handheld dynamic, some form of microphone shoved directly into your face because that is what talk radio did, and if that is the sound you are trying to accomplish, that is how you accomplish it. 
Because of that, there are now expectations about what a podcast ought to sound like. And if you want your audio to not stand out, if you don't want to challenge your listener, and if you just want people to be able to get the content that you're delivering without them having to question anything, I guess fitting the mold is what makes the most sense. It's what's expected. And in my opinion for podcasts, it's what sounds good, especially considering the typical playback location of podcasts. A lot of people will listen in their cars where there's a bunch of background noise. You want optimal signal to noise ratio. They'll be listening through earbuds on public transit with a bunch of background noise. So again, having a really good signal to back Background noise ratio is going to be important. Having compression to make sure there's not a big shift from the quiet to the loud is also going to be important. And that's why podcasts sound the way they do. Now, fast forward a couple of years to the introduction of video podcasts, or I guess the popularity of video podcasts, and bingo, bango, bongo, you have the big fat microphone and frame a couple inches away from your mouth. The reason it's still there is because a lot of these video podcasts, my own included, is an audio first format. So we are still producing the audio to be consumed like a standard podcast. So we need our audio to live up to that standard. Now, you may argue that once a podcast introduces a video element, they should move the microphone out of frame. Get a lav mic, get a shotgun microphone, get an SDC, do anything to get that big distracting thing out of your face. But for the majority of us, we are not just producing video content. We are still producing that audio content that goes out over MP3 that people consume while they're driving in their car, that they consume while they're sitting on public transit. So we need to have that same audio quality. On top of that, if we have been producing our show for quite a number of years, people have become acclimated to a certain sound profile. If you go from using an SM7B, or in this case, a BCM104, four inches away from your mouth, and that's what you've been using for five years, and then you jump to a lav mic, sat directly at a desk with a computer monitor, reflecting your voice, bouncing around, just going right back into the mic and sounding less than optimal, that can be kind of a big shock, especially if you are an audio-only listener and you don't have that visual cue that anything has changed. All you hear is the degradation of the audio. So based on the conditioning of podcast listeners, based on what the original podcasters were going for, that is why I think video podcasts in particular still have a big fat mic in frame. And factor number three is overcoming shortcomings. The vast majority of online content creators do not have professional studios. We are recording in a spare bedroom. We are recording in a closet. We are recording in rooms that do not sound optimal. There is plenty of reverb. There is ambient noise. There is a bunch of distractions going on around you that you do not want making it into the recording. So there are a couple of solutions here. Number one is exceedingly expensive. Soundproof your room. I do not mean sound treat. Soundproof your room so no sounds from outside make its way in. That reduces the ambient noise coming in from outdoors. Treating your room, that will reduce the amount of reflections. And then shutting off all the stuff around you that causes excessive noise, that's a simple and cheap and essentially free solution there. But when it comes to the soundproofing and sound treatment of a room, that can be very expensive. It can be very difficult, especially if you do not own the place that you're recording in. So you have to come up with some other solutions there. And the simplest and freest solution is just get the microphone closer to your sound source. That is going to improve the signal to background noise ratio and remove or reduce a lot of those background noises that you don't want in your recording without having to make any kind of modifications to your room. You may hate the sound, you may think a big fat microphone being in frame ruins a video, but I much prefer a more direct sounding recording, a much cleaner sounding recording with fewer background distractions going on, much more preferable than a clear frame 
with a bunch of background noise, with a bunch of ambient noise that draws my attention away from what is being communicated. Now, I understand there are plenty of television talk shows and broadcasts that use lav mics that get perfectly listenable audio, but I think the reason they're able to do that is the vast majority of them, if not all of them, are recorded in professional studios. Those studios are going to have ways to mitigate external noise making its way in. They are going to have sound treatment to reduce the amount of reflections. They are just going to be much better designed. They are going to be much more controlled as opposed to a bedroom in an apartment in a house that was designed to sleep in, not to record in. So they have a lot more factors that are playing in their favor that I believe allow them to use lav mics more effectively. They also likely have very talented audio engineers, boom operators, and post-production engineers who understand what they're doing with lav mics. They have decades of experience using them, fine-tuning them, understanding the intricacies and outricacies. That's not a term of the mics and how to process them effectively. Where on the other hand, I do not. I am none of those things. I am not an audio engineer. I am not a boom operator. I am not a talented post-production engineer. I'm a dope sitting in a spare bedroom recording. That's what I am. That is my belief on the three factors why people use big fat microphones sat in frame when maybe some people prefer having nothing in frame. Now let's jump to what you had to say, and the first comment comes from Dan Magoo, and he says, Another use case for labs is where somebody has zero mic technique and no interest in developing any. Confession, that's my wife. I love her, but she is my direct opposite in her total disinterest in audio equipment and general aversion to technology. But she has to record videos for work occasionally, so instead of letting her embarrass herself yelling into a webcam mic, I put a lav on her for such things, and it's a huge improvement, even with very basic lavs. So if we want to say lavs are bad or good, it depends on what we are comparing them to. Dan, thank you very much for the comment and thank you for your input here. I think you raise a very good point. Context matters here and you raise a very good use case. If somebody has zero interest in learning mic technique or they have tried to learn and just suck at it, having a lav mic, having a microphone on the speaker that follows them around is likely going to give you a much better result than having a static microphone that they just drift off of while they're talking because that sounds terrible. Or if the only other option is a webcam microphone that's four or five feet away, chances are a lav mic clipped to your body is going to sound better than that. You'll have a more direct sound. You'll have less reverb. You'll have less ambient background noise. You'll have a better signal to background noise ratio. So I think you raise a perfect situation where a lav mic may be ideal. And adding on top of that, unless you work in an audio field, I think that work calls and work videos have a lot more leniency and quality. I have a confession to make. I don't use any of my audio gear for my day job. I use an Audio Technica M50 USB headset with the microphone just plopped right down. Never received a single complaint. Would I like to use a U87 running through an outboard analog tube preamp and compressor? Sure, get my money's worth. But do I? Absolutely not. Even if I did, I don't think a single person would notice or care because when you're at work, you're just trying to get through the day. You don't care. You're not listening to any of this stuff for the joy of it. You're not listening for pleasure. You're listening to just get the information. Just just let me get through this and move on with my day. So as long as the audio is not painful, as long as it is not distracting, then I say you're good. And as you mentioned, if somebody has zero desire to learn mic technique or does not practice it, that lav mic sounds like it may be the best solution. Thank you very much, Dan. Let's go to the next comment from 45 Kevin R. He says, 
I am slightly intrigued as to whether the lav mic signature is especially unkind to your voice or many people's voices. There was a long phase where they seemed to be the standard for TV news and interviews, perhaps because they didn't want to pay someone to work a boom and he can set different levels for each untrained person. Kevin, thank you very much for the comment and thank you for the question. I will preface this by saying I have no idea. I have not worked in television. I have never been to a television studio. There are people who are experts who would have a better answer to this question. Perhaps they can share. First, I think you're right. Untrained people. It's a micro. It goes back to what Dan just said. Having people who do not know mic technique, having a microphone on their body that follows them will allow you to capture them all the time without having a boom op there to cue microphone to microphone, person to person. There you go. There you go. There you go. Don't have to worry about that. The mic is on them, following them at all time. But also, a lot of these talk shows and interviews are handled in professional studios that have been designed to mitigate external noise making its way in. They have treatment to reduce the amount of reflections, so that's going to help as well. And then this also goes back to what I was mentioning earlier, understanding the typical playback system of the end consumer. For television, the typical playback system is a television. Those speakers, a lot of them don't sound good. They are four, five, six feet away from the listener. There is ambient noise in the listener's room. All of that compounds on itself to mask a lot of the character of a laugh mic. It makes it a lot less noticeable what is going on with the microphone. All you really hear is the words coming out of their mouth as my second camera dies because the battery pack is dead. So that is my take on it. But I am sure there is somebody watching or listening to this who does work in television, who has worked on these talk shows, who may be able to offer some additional insight here. What do people do in those situations to mitigate the character of lav mics? Do they compress the heck out of it? Do they EQ them to heaven and back? Do they noise gate them? Do they auto mix it to reduce the amount of bleed? What do they do in these professional interview talk show situations where everybody is using lav mics? That would be interesting to know. Let us know in the comments. Let us learn from you for free. Thank you. Let's go to the next comment, which comes from Metroid Child. They say, One huge service that reviewing bad products does is that you will eventually find diamonds in the rough like the Samson Go mic or the XM8500. Will they survive 20 years of harsh stage abuse? Probably not. Will they get the job done if you are in a pinch or lack the cash? Absolutely. Speaking of cheap mics though, you should definitely check out some sure ripoff mics like the T-Bone MB75, MB85, or MB7 Beta USB. Last one is by far the most unique. Metroid Child, thank you very much for the comment. I think you're exactly right. Those are additional benefits to reviewing bad or cheap products. It allows you to potentially find a diamond in the rough. Had I not bought the Samson Go mic, had I not bought the XM8500, had I just written them off and said, ah, they're 20 bucks, they're 30 bucks, who gives a heck about those? I wouldn't be able to recommend them as much as I do. 10 years on almost, the XM8500 is still a crazy value. The more and more I test of the budget USB realm, the more I realize what a value the Samson Go mic is. Yes, it's limited to 16-bit, I think 48 kilohertz, maybe even 44.1, but it sounds surprisingly good, and it even has a headphone port, which most budget USB microphones nowadays lack. No headphone jack, and a lot of them sound worse than the Samson Go mic. So, yeah, very good point and another reason why reviewing affordable gear can be exciting. That was one of the first things that really made me enjoy reviewing budget gear. But then I got to the point where it seemed as though there was too much churn. You buy a cheap microphone, you spend 20 hours, 30 hours reviewing it, you publish it saying, hey, this sucks. 
then it's discontinued. I mean, I guess that's good because now nobody's going to buy it. But now that 20 to 30 hours is wasted. It got a bit too churny for me. I would have to be reviewing the same USB budget microphone every single week just to stay up to date with it. It got a bit dull, so I lost interest in it. And then I started focusing on the higher end stuff, which is super interesting as well. But there you run into an issue where it's like, hey, surprise, it's $500 and it sounds good. Do you like this one more than this one? <laughs> like once you get to a certain price point, it's not... Oh, wow. I can't believe they put this out. This is garbage. So it gets a bit dull every week saying, hey, this one's good too. That's why I have landed on this current schedule where I'll do a cheap microphone, a higher end microphone, a preamp, a Q&A video. That way, every couple of weeks, I have a different kind of production schedule or focus and that keeps the videos more interesting. But I agree completely, reviewing cheap microphones can yield, can lead to the discovery of diamonds in the rough, and that is a win for everybody because that's the most exciting thing nowadays, how accessible recording has become. There is almost zero reason to have bad audio nowadays with how affordable everything has become. Thank you very much, Metroid Child. I appreciate your input. That is it for what you had to say. We are now jumping to V for V because this is a value for value podcast. I do not put ads on this show. I do not put it behind a paywall. I just share information. And if you get value out of that, just return the value in whatever way you find appropriate or possible. Time, talent, or treasure. Right now, we are focusing on the treasure, and first up comes from TechMed, Raina Richter. He says, Danke, with 25 euro. Raina, thank you so much for the 25 euro. Your continued support just baffles me. I really do appreciate it, and it allows me to keep this show ad-free. It allows me to pay the podcast hosting bills. It allows me to pay for the annual domain registration and hosting so I can upload the high quality videos or high quality audio rather to my website. So thank you so much for your continued support. I truly do appreciate it. Next, we have five euro, five pound, not euro, right? Pound? Yeah, that's GBP. From Tim, he says, Thanks for all you do and all you bring, Mr. Bantrew. I love hearing your thoughts, suggestions, reviews, and humor. Makes my week. Could I ask for a whoa, whoa, boop for me? My name is Tim. Tim, thank you so much for the five pounds. I really do appreciate it, and I appreciate the kind words as well. The fact that you come back every single week means the world to me. And of course, you can have a whoa, whoa, boop. I will go ahead and give it to you. Hey, Tim. Whoa, whoa. That was a high-pitched boop. Should I get... Fat Calf Media. Whoa, whoa, boop. Two high-pitched ones. I don't know where that came from. Turned into a little girl. Boop, ooh. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> Next, we have... Gosh, I don't, I don't know what that was. <laughs> oh, boy. We will not edit that. We will leave that in. That's it. <laughs> That's some added value for you, Tim. We have $5 from Top Tier Audio. He says, any plans to add value streaming to your RSS feed? I'd love to send money your way as I'm listening, and the audio podcast is my preferred option. Top Tier Audio, thank you so much for the 5 USD. I really do appreciate it. As far as jumping on the podcast 2.0 feature set, add streaming to the RSS feed, I don't know what goes into that. A couple years ago, or maybe a year ago, Darren O'Neill from randomthoughts.com and planetrage.show mentioned that I need to get onboarded and just do it. I never got around to it. I am a big dum dumb. I like things that are simple, straightforward. Just hit this button and it's done. And with podcasting 2.0 functions, I don't think that's the case yet. If there is some simple documentation like a QRC saying, hit this button, hit this button, sign up here and you're done, I'll go ahead and try to do that sometime in the next couple of months. 
But if it requires me to switch my podcast host or anything horrifying like that, I'll probably avoid it for longer. And my podcast host has shown zero interest in supporting 2.0 functionality because they are a bunch of weenies. Are you hearing me? My podcast host, you know who you are. Bunch of weenies, I tell you. Support podcasting 2.0 functions. I would love you for doing that. But no, you're not going to do it. And I think I clipped. But for the time being, I don't have that set up. Darren O'Neill, holler at me on pod.social. Let me know. Tell me that I'm a big dum-dum and walk, walk it through me. Walk it through me. <laughs> walk me through it like I am a five-year-old. Bandrew, hit this button. Hit this button. Sign up here, idiot. And then I'll go ahead and do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Top Tier Audio. Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you very much, Raina. If you enjoy this podcast, if you enjoy it being ad-free, it is thanks to the generosity of these incredible people. So thank you to them. And that is it for this show. No Ask Bandrew this week. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for spending your time with me. I know you have about a trillion options on what you could do with your time. The fact that you choose to spend a minute of it with me is an honor. So that sounded very insincere. (laughs) I just couldn't think of the word that I was trying to say. What's the word? It makes me sound insincere. My inability to speak and think. I was dropped on my head as a kid. Give me a break. (laughs) I'm sincere. Okay. Thank you so much for coming by. I appreciate you so much. I hope you have an amazing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next Sunday, I will talk at you. Admitting that I was dropped on my head as a kid, everybody watching is like, oh yeah, (laughs) all of it makes sense now. (laughs) I love you so much. I will talk to you (laughs) next week. Bye-bye. Whoa, whoa, boop. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.